thank you very much uh, uh, for, for the invitation. Uh, it is uh, incredibly well-timed uh, since we really just uh, launched ourselves to the public last week with our, uh, our first report. Uh, so this is a, a great opportunity to look at some of the uh, sort of the longer-term issues uh, surrounding the Council. And I will actually say a little bit uh, about the first report as well. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the role of fiscal councils, uh, hopefully in preventing uh, the uh, kind of problems that arose uh, in, in Ireland. Uh, the particular design uh, of, uh, of our council, I'm going to talk a little bit about our uh, first uh, fiscal assessment report and then uh, look to the, uh, to, the, to the challenges facing the council. So the starting point is uh, really the principles uh, of, uh, of good uh, fiscal policy. And uh, the first thing I want to stress is that we really are looking at it from a macroeconomic perspective. We're not sort of getting into the issue of what's the right size uh, of government, which is uh, something that really beyond a, a council, these are uh, very much sort of political decisions. Uh, but in terms of good macroeconomic fiscal policy management, in terms of the size of the deficit and the debt, uh, really that is our space. Uh, so there's a, uh, uh, I understand that, that most of you here are, are economists, uh, so you'll be sort of well aware of a sort of very active debate in the economics literature uh, about what uh, uh, good fiscal policy is. Uh, and sort of a starting point uh, for many of the discussions is this idea of the irrelevance of deficits, uh, which would surprise uh, non-economists. Uh, so there is a sort of belief under certain conditions that uh, really deficits and debt uh, really don't matter. And this is an idea associated uh, sort of most recently with the Harvard economist Robert Barrow. But the reason it's sort of useful is that when you see the assumptions required for deficits not to matter, you realize that deficits uh, are likely to, 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 to matter a great deal. Uh, so the assumptions required that people have sort of infinite horizons, that capital markets work perfectly, uh, there's no concerns about the government uh, uh, not defaulting, uh, and so on. When you relax these assumptions, uh, you see that uh, deficits uh, and debt can matter a great deal. And I think there is uh, a uh, growing consensus about what good uh, fiscal policy is, uh, or some uh, sort of broad principles of sound uh, fiscal management. Uh, and these principles are that, uh, uh, that you have a stable fiscal system, uh, which could be sort of captured by tax rates being reasonably stable over time. Uh, we don't want uh, tax rates to have to rise a lot in the future, for instance, to, the, to pay for the cost uh, of an aging population or higher health care costs. Uh, so for reasons of intergenerational fairness, but also just for reasons of economic efficiency, we want a reasonably stable system, not only for, for tax rates, but also for benefits rates, such as uh, so pension rates, uh, so that people can sort of plan for their retirement uh, and, and sort of believe that those pensions uh, will be there. Uh, another important principle is that uh, we need to uh, maintain creditworthiness, something that would have been sort of taken for granted up until quite recently, uh, but uh, uh, we certainly need to, uh, to manage fiscal policy to make sure uh, that uh, uh, creditworthiness is, is retained. And finally, uh, that we need to have enough fiscal space to engage in countercyclical fiscal policies uh, uh, when needed. Uh, so this is uh, sort of, uh, I think, uh, a set of principles that's sort of broadly agreed within the economics pro uh, profession uh, in terms of what sound fiscal policy management is. But, and this is not meant to be in any way specific to Ireland, uh, the literature has very much focused on the idea that there are political biases uh, of various uh, kinds in the making of fiscal policy uh, that will often move us away uh, from these uh, uh, principles of, of, of sound fiscal management. Um, and uh, these biases can take various f uh, forms. Uh, many of them can be sort of grouped as uh, resulting from uh, conflicts of interest of various types. There's the common pool problem where various interest groups control uh, or influence spending in particular areas and don't worry about the, the ex externality uh, that their push for spending has uh, in terms of the need for higher taxes or potentially higher deficits to pay for that spending. So you basically have this collective action problem uh, that leads to uh, essentially excess uh, uh, deficits in the economy. You can also have short political uh, uh, time horizons. Governments are only in power for a certain length of time uh, and are not surprisingly not going to be that concerned uh, or as concerned about what happens when they leave office. Uh, so again, you can have this bias towards deficits uh, and debt accumulation. Uh, you can also have strategic deficits. I don't think this is a big issue in the Irish case, but I think it's a huge issue in the U.S. case, particularly when you have administrations uh, of different ideological uh, leaning uh, following one another. So the Bush tax cuts could have been seen as 
uh, an effort to actually constrain uh, future democratic uh, administrations by having big deficits, building up debt, and making it harder for uh, future democratic administrations uh, to maintain uh, spending. Uh, so uh, this can again uh, lead to uh, a bias towards deficits and debt. Uh, and finally, there is the, the fact that uh, people are not equally well informed. Uh, you could have the government being quite well informed about what it needs to do, but dealing with a relatively uninformed population. Uh, and then if you have various sort of populist media, media or populist politicians, uh, it can make it very hard for the government uh, to stay in power uh, doing the right thing. But you could also have a populist government uh, sort of willing to sort of exploit uh, the, um, uh, the, the fact that the population is not fully informed uh, to pursue policies that may be good politically in the short term, uh, but not good for the, uh, for the longer term. So all of these uh, sorts of uh, uh, conflicts of interest uh, lead uh, to this, uh, this bias towards deficits and debt. And then I think very importantly, there's an, an additional political problem uh, that, uh, again, uh, the economists among you will be very familiar with, this idea of time and consistency and the commitment to problem uh, associated with it. Uh, and it comes really in this context from the fact that default is, is there as an option. Uh, but expectations of default uh, lead to a higher risk premium uh, and uh, they can maybe lead to, com to, to market exclusion completely. Uh, and there's a danger of falling into this bad equilibrium where uh, the markets come to expect uh, default, push up interest rates, uh, and because uh, of the higher interest rates, uh, default uh, uh, actually happens. Uh, and the, the reason this is sort of stemming from a problem in politics is that if governments could actually commit uh, and really convince the markets that default would be an absolutely uh, last resort, they could avoid getting into this uh, cycle uh, of expectations becoming self-fulfilling. Uh, but because they can't make those uh, commitments, uh, they, uh, uh, these expectations uh, develop uh, and you can sort of fall into the kind of traps uh, that we've been uh, seeing at the moment. So a starting point is that under democratic politics, again, it's nothing Irish specific, there are problems with the uh, formulation of fiscal policy. Uh, and then the idea is that uh, fiscal <coughs> institutions of various kinds uh, can be designed to improve fiscal policy, uh, sort of moving us towards uh, those sound principles that I talked about earlier. And the institutions can be uh, really fiscal processes, uh, sort of strong uh, departments of finance uh, that can uh, sort of solve this uh, common pool problem that I uh, talked about before. Uh, the literature shows actually that strong departments of finance don't tend to work that as well in the context of coalition governments. So the new institutional innovation of actually having both coalition partners being sort of part of finance with this new Department uh, of Public Expenditure and Reform uh, seems like a, a sort of a very good innovation in terms of dealing with that, sort of moving in the direction of medium-term frameworks and sort of longer-term commitments uh, to good fiscal policy. And there's a movement around the world uh, towards this idea of fiscal uh, uh, charters uh, that really uh, allow the government to really commit uh, to pursuing uh, sound fiscal policy management. Uh, so there's uh, been uh, important innovations in countries like New Zealand and Australia, and recently the UK, uh, in putting these fiscal charters in place. Uh, and I think this is uh, something that could be uh, considered, and I think will be considered in the context of the upcoming fiscal responsibility bill here. Another part of the fiscal institutions to put, is to put in place fiscal rules. Uh, that really raise the costs uh, of uh, pursuing bad fiscal policies uh, because uh, to pursue the bad fiscal policies, you essentially have to break the fiscal rule uh, and there's just more attention uh, uh, drawn uh, to the uh, poor fiscal performance of the government. A problem with fiscal rules, however, is that the ideal fiscal rules require a lot of flexibility uh, to deal with... Uh, shocks that hit the economy, uh, there may be a need to sort of pursue counter-cyclical policies to deal with the recession. So it can be very hard uh, to see if the fiscal rules are really being followed when you allow for the, uh, for, for the flexibility around that rule. Uh, so there's been uh, a little bit of uh, dissatisfaction with fiscal rules as a way to solve the problem. And so there's been a move uh, in the literature and actually around the world uh, in terms of actual fiscal policies uh, to increase uh, the role of uh, what I refer to, refer to here as fiscal agencies, uh, sort of model a little bit uh, on the idea of uh, uh, independent central banks, uh, which have sort of very clear objectives uh, and uh, are considered to uh, 
uh, have uh, sort of to provide a sort of a good balance between rules on the one hand and the need for discretion uh, on the other. Uh, and often fiscal agencies sort of uh, uh, focused on the implementation of fiscal rules. That combination where they complement each other uh, can be a particularly good combination. Uh, so fiscal agencies can, can take really different forms. Fiscal authorities would actually give the agency powers uh, over fiscal policy, for instance, the power to decide what the deficit should be. Uh, and that's, again, somewhat like uh, an independent central bank uh, that has the power to actually uh, set the interest rate. But I think there's, uh, for the most part, a consensus, uh, not a complete consensus, but uh, uh, sort of a... Uh, a reasonable uh, agreement that in a democracy uh, the nature of fiscal policy is such that you don't want to delegate uh, to an independent agency even for something like the deficit. That these are, uh, there's disagreement first of all in terms of what uh, optimal fiscal policy is uh, and uh, uh, the, these issues are intensely uh, redistributional uh, and uh, for, for that reason these are decisions that should be made by elected representatives. Uh, not appointed officials. So then there's this idea of a fiscal council, which is sort of a soft version uh, of the fiscal agency, uh, and the idea is that a fiscal council would be more advisory, uh, really uh, focusing on uh, assessing and inputting uh, in terms of its analysis into the fiscal policy process, but ultimately recognizing that these uh, fiscal policy decisions are decisions that have to be made by, uh, by governments. So the basic rationales then for fiscal councils would be, on the one hand, uh, better analysis, so identifying uh, what good fiscal policy is or what appropriate fiscal policy is, and also to try to reduce these various political biases that I talked about before, essentially by raising the costs uh, of running inappropriate fiscal policy. Uh, there are varieties of fiscal councils around the world. Uh, they really go back uh, to, the, to the 1940s, uh, and a fiscal uh, council or wasn't called a fiscal council, but uh, very much functioning as a fiscal council in the Netherlands. Uh, the, U the US uh, put effectively a fiscal council in place with its Congressional Budget Office in the 1970s. There have also been uh, important uh, uh, councils operating for some time in countries like Belgium and Denmark. Uh, and in recent years, there's been uh, growing interest in fiscal councils. Uh, so the UK has put a fiscal council in place, Sweden, uh, uh, has done so, uh, Slovenia, uh, Canada. Uh, so th they're becoming uh, a more and more accepted part uh, of the overall uh, fiscal uh, architecture around the world. Uh, and they, they come in, in, in very different forms and do very different things, often responding to uh, different problems that exist uh, uh, in uh, uh, different countries. So in the case of the UK, uh, which is the one we're probably uh, most familiar with here, it gets a, it's in the news a lot, so they have this new uh, Office of uh, Budgetary Responsibility. Uh, it is responsible for actually making the government's uh, macroeconomic forecasts and budgetary projections. Uh, so there was this uh, concern uh, that that process of making forecasts and projections had become politicized um, uh, under the, uh, the, the previous Labour government. Uh, and so uh, they got that particular responsibility, which is actually a very uh, resource-intensive uh, activity. They also have the role uh, of uh, uh, checking the consistency of government policies with the government's own fiscal rules. Interestingly, they're not mandated to provide an assessment of the overall uh, fiscal stance, so they don't have this normative uh, role. On the other hand, in Sweden, without going into the details of what the Swedish Fiscal Poli Policy Council do, they do have this normative mandate to actually assess uh, the appropriateness of the fiscal policy that the government is pursuing. So our mandate uh, is actually uh, more like the Swedish mandate. We, we are not... Uh, given the, the job of actually making uh, the government's uh, macroeconomic forecasts and budgetary projections. But we are given the, the job of uh, assessing the, the soundness uh, of, uh, of those forecasts uh, and projections and the, uh, the, the methods being used to actually produce them. But what's uh, particularly distinctive about our role is that we do have this uh, normative element to our mandate uh, to assess the appropriateness of the overall fiscal stance that the government is pursuing. Uh, and with the new fiscal responsibility uh, bill and uh, uh, eventual act uh, that is meant to be, the, the bill is meant to be published by the end of the year, um, uh, there will be new fiscal rules put in place and uh, part of our mandate will be to assess the consistency of the government's uh, uh, policies uh, with, those, uh, with those rules. And uh, the minister can also add uh, additional 
uh, jobs to, uh, to the list uh, as well. But uh, hopefully he won't for the moment because uh, we still are quite small. Uh, so the council, who are we? Uh, so the idea was to bring uh, international uh, expertise into this. Uh, so the uh, council is made up of Sebastian Barnes, who is a, a long-term fiscal expert, uh, or an expert on long-term fiscal issues in the, in the OECD. Uh, you uh, uh, probably know Alan Barrett, uh, who was the editor of the Quarterly Economic Commentary uh, for some time, uh, but also his main research is very much looking at uh, longer-term fiscal issues. Uh, Donald Donovan, again, uh, many of you will know, who is uh, currently an adjunct professor at the University of Limerick uh, and formerly a uh, deputy director at the, at the IMF. Uh, there is me, I'm uh, the chair of the council. Uh, and we've also uh, Roshin O'Sullivan, uh, uh, who is a professor at Smith's College uh, in uh, Massachusetts uh, and has sort of worked a lot uh, in the area of monetary policy on the design uh, of uh, good institutions to make monetary policy work better. So uh, she brings a lot of expertise in terms of institutional design. Uh, we have a small secretariat uh, uh, headed by uh, Dermot Smith, uh, who's on secondment from the, from the central bank. Um, and uh, you can see uh, our resources are fairly thin, uh, given uh, the, uh, the uh, quite uh, extensive uh, mandate uh, that we have, and I can assure you everybody is being extremely busy. Uh, I should say that the, the council are essentially volunteers. These are in addition to our, our, uh, our real jobs. The uh, non-public sector members uh, of the council receive a, a small uh, a stipend, uh, but the, uh, the members of the council uh, that actually work in the public sector, which is myself and, uh, and Alan, uh, uh, do, do not get compensated for, for our work here. Uh, so in terms of delivering on the mandate uh, so that we can actually uh, uh, do what we're meant to do and play the, the important role that fiscal councils can play, uh, the, what I see as being uh, critical is that we have to have the technical comp competencies to do the analysis. Uh, uh, credible analysis and, uh, uh, and to bring that to the public. Uh, so we're building those technical competencies, competencies, competencies uh, at the moment. Uh, I'm a little bit concerned uh, that we really don't have the resources and the resources haven't planned for us to play the role that we, uh, we need to play. Uh, so that's something that I think that will have to be looked at. Uh, critically uh, is the perception of our independence. Uh, that's our independence from finance. There's a balancing act here in the sense that we need information from finance, we need data, we need to understand methodologies, uh, but at the same time, we absolutely have to uh, prevent any sort of capture uh, of finance, uh, uh, of the activities of the council. Uh, so we keep our interactions with finance to an absolute minimum and very much uh, sort of based uh, on sort of technical uh, questions. And uh, uh, given that independence is, is, is so critical, we also have to think about accountability. Uh, but we want that accountability to be as uh, uh, divorced as possible uh, from finance itself. Uh, so, for instance, uh, uh, we will be making appearances before uh, relevant Oireachtas uh, committees. We're going to be having peer review of our activities and, and so on. So we actually have our uh, first appearance before the uh, joint Oireachtas committee on finance, uh, public expenditure and reform uh, next week uh, on the uh, first report. And public visibility will be absolutely critical, which is why I'm uh, uh, very happy to, to do events such as this. Uh, so we are a public watchdog, uh, and uh, we're not going to be sort of working through back channels uh, to finance in terms of our assessments. They're going to be very much public assessments. Uh, and we tried to get off to a good start last week uh, by getting as much uh, uh, sort of public visibility to our first assessment report as possible. Uh, so the permanent design of the council uh, will be... Uh, determined in this new fiscal responsibility bill. Uh, so we're just currently operating on an interim basis. And we're, uh, one of the things we're doing at the moment is really uh, trying to figure out uh, uh, how we need to be designed to ensure uh, that we have the resources that we need to, to, uh, to function properly, that we are uh, independent, uh, we have this public visibility, and so on. So key outputs, we will be uh, reporting uh, at least three times per year. We'll have these biannual fiscal assessment reports. We will also have an annual report, which will probably be uh, more focused on, on, on longer-term fiscal issues uh, and, and shorter supplementary, supplementary commentaries as required, for instance, in response to the budget, in response to the publication of the pre-budget outlook, and so on. And at the moment, we're working very hard in terms of our input into the fiscal responsibility bill, 
uh, which is uh, following on from the <coughs> Department of Finance discussion document, which laid out the, the government's plan in this particular area. And we'll be uh, uh, reporting again publicly in terms of our advice and, uh, for the design uh, of the bill shortly. The real value of the council is for the, for the long term uh, to prevent uh, the kind of crisis uh, uh, that uh, uh, we're, we're still uh, trying to find our way out of. Uh, so uh, it really is a, a surveillance role to make sure that these vulnerabilities that uh, led to the crisis are not allowed to occur again. Uh, but we're also sort of inputting into uh, sort of the medium-term fiscal uh, strategy, uh, and uh, that's really what our first uh, assessment report was all about. This is a sort of a critical moment in the making of Irish fiscal policy. Uh, uh, there's going to be a new, essentially, four-year plan uh, uh, as part of the pre-budget outlook, uh, Tishik was actually talking about the, uh, the, the, the timing of that. It looks like it's going to come out in early November. So we actually accelerated our activities a bit to make sure that we could get our first assessment report out early enough before the decisions were made so that we could actually have an input into the making of that uh, uh, medium-term fiscal strategy. As you know, the Troika have been in town, so lots of decisions are going to be, uh, uh, are going to be made sort of around now or probably have been made. Uh, but um, uh, I think we were able to get in sort of early enough uh, that uh, our analysis could actually have some uh, impact in those deliberations. So how am I, how am I doing on, on, on time? Uh, I'm doing very well. Okay. Uh, so I'm just going to say just a little bit about the, uh, the uh, fiscal assessment report uh, itself. Um, so... Uh, Again, this was uh, sort of mainly uh, focused on, on what the government's medium-term fiscal strategy should be. And in terms of the existing fiscal strategy, we took as our starting point uh, the uh, stability program update uh, that was published in April, which re really lays out the government's uh, uh, fiscal targets. So you see here the projections for the uh, debt-to-GDP ratio uh, that it would sort of peak in uh, 2013 uh, and then, become, uh, then start coming down, but still uh, remain at a very high level, uh, well over 100% of GDP by 2015. Uh, and really the strategy is this set of targets. So you've been uh, hearing a lot about the target for next year of 8.6% uh, general government deficit uh, with the uh, plan to bring that deficit down below 3% of GDP by 2015. And this last line uh, shows the discretionary fiscal adjustments that will be required uh, or estimated to be required to actually hit these targets. Uh, so the, another number that's been in the news a lot is the need for a 3.6 billion adjustment uh, uh, in 2012. Uh, and there's been sort of debate about whether that would be enough to hit this particular target of 8.6% of GDP. So, one of the things we uh, did in the report is to uh, assess the budgetary projections themselves um, in, in terms of uh, whether they seem to be, uh, to be valid. We found that they were sort of broadly appropriate at the time of the SPU. We could find no sort of obvious biases in the way those uh, projections were made. Uh, since then, we know that the exchequer returns have been pretty close to, uh, uh, to target, but there have been a number of uh, uh, developments since the SPU was published. Uh, including the reduction in, in official uh, interest rates, which has substantially reduced uh, the average interest rate in outstanding debt. Uh, it looks like for this year alone, we'll reduce that average interest rate by about three-tenths of a percentage point and by more than half a percentage point between uh, 2013 and 2015. And that, again, is the average interest rate on the total outstanding debt, uh, including the official and non-official loans. Also, the uh, anticipated cost of bank recapitalization has been somewhat less than was projected uh, earlier in the year. So it looks like the cost to the state of the bank recapitalization is now going to be about uh, 3.5 billion less uh, because of uh, greater than anticipated uh, uh, loss sharing with junior bondholders and also the uh, success of Bank of Ireland in, in actually raising uh, private capital. And then uh, uh, there has been also developments in terms of uh, uh, GDP. 2010 uh, GDP was revised upwards, but the growth for, for GDP uh, uh, for 2011 and 2012, the projected growth, uh, has been revised downwards, which is the, the big sort of negative in all of this. So most of these developments have been positive. Uh, uh, the uh, downward revision of growth, uh, in particular uh, in relation to the softening of global growth prospects, has been, has been negative. So really what we're, what we're doing here is just allowing for these post-SPU developments uh, not that we're making really alternative uh, uh, projections from the government. 
But in order to be able to assess uh, their fiscal stance, we really needed to know where things stood at the moment, given these developments. Uh, and it's a sort of a pity, in a way, uh, that much of the coverage last week was sort of focusing on the different estimates uh, that we've come to in terms of what's going to sort of happen uh, in terms of these key fiscal variables out over the next uh, number of years to 2015. But that was seemed to be where the main media focus was. So we've developed what we call a fiscal feedbacks model, uh, which allows us to make these projections. Uh, so it's sort of based on the SPU, but allows us to run uh, sort of alternative uh, uh, scenarios uh, through it uh, to see what the effect of alternative fiscal policies uh, would be. So that's where uh, these results are coming from. Uh, so when we uh, allow for all these various developments, uh, we uh, estimate that the deficit would be 8.8% of GDP next year if the government still uh, followed its plans. But very interestingly, uh, if, it, if it followed its plans, uh, it would still actually hit the 2.8% of GDP target for 2015. So the problem is really just really a problem for, for, for next year, missing the 86 target for 2012. Uh, when we put all these things together, the government is still on track uh, to hit uh, the uh, uh, target of getting the, uh, uh, the deficit down below 3% of GDP by 2015. So the additional adjustments required uh, to hit the 8.6% uh, of GDP target are essentially an extra 400 uh, million in adjustments, bringing the overall adjustment required for 2012 uh, to, uh, uh, to, to 4 billion. But again, this is not really the, I think, the main uh, value of the council, uh, it, but it's just that we needed to know where things stood at the moment uh, as we looked at the overall fiscal stance itself. So, in terms of the assessment of the fiscal stance, which we're taking here to be the actual targets for the general government deficit out to 2015, and particularly that target of bringing it down below 3% of GDP. So it's clearly a, balance, a difficult balancing act in terms of these principles of good fiscal management that I talked about before. Uh, on the one hand, uh, the uh, public finances need to be rebuilt. The debt is still incredibly high and falling quite slowly. Uh, there were, as you know, huge funding uh, vulnerabilities, uh, both for market funding and official funding. I'll talk about that more in just a second. And then, of course, we have to be concerned about the effects of austerity on the economy, uh, uh, which uh, we believe will be, will be negative uh, for the economy. So we don't believe in this idea of the expansion of fiscal uh, contraction, that austerity actually uh, increases growth. So there are real trade-offs here. Uh, and uh, identifying the uh, proper fiscal stance is, uh, is, is really a matter of, uh, of judgment and a difficult balancing act. Uh, but the big question we're asking ourselves, is, is there an argument for more ambitious targets? Uh, this graph just shows the fragility of our debt sustainability. On current plans, it does look like we will stabilize the debt-to-GDP ratio and it will slowly begin coming down. If nominal GDP growth is one percentage point less than forecast, uh, it will still stabilize, but at a, at a substantially higher level, about 120% of GDP. If nominal GDP came in two percentage points less, which is conceivable, uh, you can see that the, uh, the debt we sort of remains on a, an explosive path, uh, uh, certainly over the period that we're, we're, we're looking at here. Also, if we do, uh, if we follow the, uh, the current strategy, uh, once we get uh, essentially to 2015, the debt will be on a very slow downward path. So even by the time we go out to 2030, uh, we're still far from the 60% Maastricht target for the debt-to-GDP ratio. Uh, so we'd be, continue to have huge vulnerabilities uh, over this period, uh, and uh, also putting a big burden uh, onto uh, future generations in the process. So this essentially assumes that the primary surplus that's achieved by 2015 is held constant, so there's sort of no further fiscal adjustment beyond that point. Uh, and we're assuming a one percentage point gap between the, the, between the interest rate uh, and, the, uh, and the growth rate. There are also huge funding vulnerabilities. Uh, so a very uncertain external environment. The uh, European crisis resolution policies are still very much in a state of flux. And what we see uh, is that there's increasingly sort of a distinction made between countries that are considered <laughs> insolvent, uh, particularly Greece, and countries that are considered illiquid, uh, which for the moment really the list is... Uh, Italy and, uh, and Spain. And then Ireland can kind of fall be, uh, in one group or the other, and it's still very much to play for. And depending on which an analyst is talking, they can actually lump Ireland in with Greece and possibly Portugal. Uh, and other analysts uh, see Ireland as being uh, more of uh, uh, sort of illiquid. And the way the policies are shaping up is that the illiquid countries will get the backstop that they need, which will be critical to getting back into the market. 
while uh, uh, default will essentially be imposed in countries that are considered to be insolvent, and we can certainly see Greece going in that direction. So there's a lot to play for, uh, and there is a huge return to really being on the right list uh, in terms of the cu country that's considered to be a liquid and will get the support that it needs to, to avoid default. I won't go into sort of issues about default, but I think that would be incredibly costly long-term uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to the Irish economy. Uh, creditworthiness is just a, a, a very valuable asset to an international trading nation uh, such as Ireland that would be uh, severely damaged uh, by any uh, sort of official default. Uh, so there's a lot to play for, uh, and it just increases the return to following a strategy uh, that uh, both... Uh, convinces markets uh, that Ireland is a good bet, uh, and also keeps the official funding in place so that even if we do need an additional program uh, after 2013, that funding will come without debt restructuring being imposed upon us. Uh, and the anticipation that debt restructuring will be imposed upon us will mean that we wouldn't get back into the market. So again, you have this uh, uh, sort of feedback uh, effect uh, working through expectations. Uh, so again, I think this, uh, these funding vulnerabilities sort of move us in the direction of doing a bit more, being somewhat more ambitious in terms of the fiscal strategy. That has to be weighed, of course, as I said, against the negative effects of austerity. Uh, so we for this report, we reviewed much of the literature on the size of fiscal multipliers. There's, as you probably know, there's huge uncertainty uh, about that. But our literature suggests, using sort of the, 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 the best studies that are out there, uh, that under current Irish conditions, multipliers, uh, deficit multipliers, what, while positives, in other words, cutting the deficit uh, will slow the economy, uh, they are likely to be relatively small. And also, uh, this idea that fiscal adjustment will be self-defeating in the sense that as you engage in discretionary uh, fiscal adjustments, that, the, uh, that the, because you slow the economy so much that the deficit might actually go up, uh, we don't find uh, evidence uh, of that. And the most basic evidence is uh, that uh, the deficit is coming down in the Irish case. Uh, uh, even as we pursue these, uh, these big discretionary adjustments, and even uh, as uh, domestic demand has actually been declining for reasons other, at least in part, other than the fiscal adjustment itself. So maybe we could go into that more in more detail in questions, uh, but uh, the, this idea that fiscal adjustment is actually self-defeating in its own terms uh, is, is not borne uh, by the evidence. So our basic assessments is that the current uh, fiscal stance being pursued by the government, we consider it to be a defensible policy. It's within the range of what we would consider appropriate fiscal policy stances. It's not obviously inappropriate. Again, this is the goal of getting the uh, deficit to below 3% of GDP by 2015. We see no case whatsoever for relaxing the targets. And that's not just because uh, of external commitments made. Uh, very much the credibility uh, of the government is now around at least meeting these targets. And on balance, uh, and this was the main recommendation of the report, and one that uh, uh, certainly uh, uh, didn't find favor with everyone, uh, but on balance, when we put all the, the, the various principles of good fiscal uh, management uh, together, uh, we see a strong case for more ambitious targets and actually uh, bringing the general uh, government deficit uh, uh, down to 1% of GDP by 2015, which would effectively sort of eliminate the underlying structural uh, deficit in the economy uh, by that point. So this will put the debt ratio on a strong downward path, or, uh, and I'll show you a graph of that in a second. It gives us a certain degree of insurance against shocks, uh, and I think it would be a timely signal of political capacity for a coalition government. And this is not meant to be any negative comment on uh, the present government, but any new government, and particularly any new coalition government, uh, there will be doubts about its actual capacity to make the difficult choices to impose losses on specific groups. And going a little bit further, uh, so that even in the upcoming budget, I think would be a strong signal that it has the capacity to see the adjustment through, which was largely behind our recommendation that even in the upcoming budget, that the target be uh, moved from 8.6% uh, of GDP to 8.4% of GDP, beginning that process of moving uh, the overall deficit down uh, to 1% of GDP. Again, it's... I do understand the criticisms uh, from the government. It's easy for us to say this, to throw out these numbers uh, when you're sitting at a cabinet table and having to make these very difficult decisions uh, to find an extra 400 uh, million of cuts. So I uh, absolutely see that. Uh, but I think, uh, again, putting it all together, that the uh, returns to these additional actions uh, are, uh, are quite high. So with the amended 
uh, stability uh, program update, with these adjustments I talked about made, and with the revised targets, uh, we see that uh, uh, based on our simulations, we would get the, uh, the deficit down to 1% of GDP uh, by 2015. And you can see here the overall discretionary adjustments that, are, that would be required to actually do this in the context of the, uh, of the model that we're using. So that's the key here. And uh, very importantly, the primary deficit would be, uh, would, there would actually be a primary surplus of close to 5% of GDP by 2015. Under the current plan, the primary surplus is only 2.9% of GDP. So even though the actual debt numbers don't look dramatically different, uh, the key is, uh, I'll just, I'll just skip this, uh, this diagram is, is key in terms of even if no additional fiscal adjustment was done, the economy is on a much uh, steeper downward path than the GDP ratio. And even though it still takes a long time to get it below 60% of GDP, we do sort of uh, reach that uh, sometime before 2030. Uh, but it's just a very different uh, uh, time path. Uh, so uh, we will have essentially have achieved an awful lot more by uh, getting to this uh, uh, larger primary surplus by 2015. Um, so maybe I'll just, uh, just mention here what this means uh, in terms of additional adjustments. Uh, overall, there would be 4.4 billion uh, of adjustment required uh, in 2012 and substantially bigger adjustments than, uh, than uh, planned uh, uh, for additional years as well. So these are the overall additional adjustments that will be required uh, both uh, to, uh, essentially both as a result of the amendments that we made to the stability program update itself and these more ambitious targets. So summary of the first report then, the basic uh, projections uh, were fine. We really didn't see any problem with that. Uh, we do believe that the 2.8% uh, uh, target for 2015 is still achievable, but based on our estimates, uh, the 8.6% of GDP target would not be achievable for next year without additional ad adjustments. But the, the, uh, uh, the basic message, uh, uh, or the basic uh, recommendation from the report uh, is that there is this case for more ambitious targets uh, in terms of bringing the deficit uh, target down from 3% of GDP to 1% of GDP. So next step for the Council uh, we're now working uh, hard in terms of our input into the fiscal responsibility bill. Uh, and uh, uh, given that it needs to be published by the end of the year, and of course Christmas comes before that and everything, uh, uh, there's been a lot of pressure put on us to, to produce our uh, input quickly. So we've just drawn a breath from getting the first report out. Uh, and uh, we've had to uh, turn to these, uh, uh, these other incredibly important issues uh, very quickly. Uh, of course, we're going to be engaging in ongoing fiscal surveillance, uh, uh, including of the upcoming uh, pre-budget outlook and the budget itself. But the most important thing that this first council uh, uh, hopes to do is to bequeath an actual strong uh, fiscal institution that will be a sort of uh, an important pillar of Ireland's uh, fiscal pol pol policy architecture so that we build up our technical uh, competencies, that we really uh, develop this reputation for independence uh, and that we're firmly established uh, as a public watchdog and the, the public is aware that we're there and trusts us uh, to be keeping a close eye uh, on fiscal policy development. So if we can achieve that as a first council, uh, uh, we will uh, uh, feel that we've, uh, we have done our job. Uh, but uh, I very much look forward to your question. Thank you very much.